good evening and welcome. Tonight we'll be going over the history and geography of Bhutan. Now I'm very zoomed in on my map here so you can't see but I do have a book to show you about Bhutan after we go over history so I'll zoom out so we can look through that but first let's do geography because Bhutan is such an interesting place geographically but it's also very small so the segment will be a little short. Bhutan borders the Tibetan area of China up here and it borders India right here. And you can kind of see on this map, oh no, you can see just fine. Nepal is just over here, Bangladesh is just over here, but it doesn't border those countries. Um, more importantly, in India, it borders the Sikkim. Um, I think they're states or regions, let's just go with regions, but I'm pretty sure. Um, we also have Assam. Uh, West Bengal and Arunachal Pradesh. So, those are the borders for Bhutan. Bhutan is very famous for its mountains, the Himalayans, the Himalaya mountain range runs right through here. Some of the more higher peaks within the Himalayas. I mean, the famous ones are over here, but these are also very, very high. The highest point in Bhutan is Gangkar Puensum, which is located right here. And this is actually the highest mountain in the world that has never been climbed. No one has ever reached its summit because it is a sacred mountain, and they believe that it should be untouched, and it still is to this day. As we go south, as you can imagine, the water trickles down this way, creating all kinds of beautiful rivers and therefore many different valleys. And we reach this flat region down here, which is known as the Dwars. Now, the majority of the Dwar region is in India, which you'll learn why in its history, but it is partially in southern Bhutan. This is the area that is the most arable. So this is where mostly rice farming, but all of the crop growing happens in Bhutan. I believe all of the rivers in Bhutan flow down into the Brahmaputra River that eventually meets up with the Ganges. So we have the capital city of Timpu right here, but since it is a very um, precarious ancient city up in the mountains. The only airport is right here in Paro, the Paro Valley. There's 18 valleys within Bhutan up here, but the Paro Valley is where we have the only uh, airport, international and domestic airport, I suppose. So this is the only really safe place to land an airplane, which gives you a good idea about the landscape of Bhutan. Also, as you can see, there's lots of different national parks within Bhutan, and that is because the government is very concerned about preserving as much nature as possible within Bhutan, which is wonderful. It's actually the only carbon sink country in the world, which means it's not carbon neutral. It's actually absorbing more carbon than it's putting out. That's how many trees are here in Bhutan and how well they're dealing with um, environmental practices. It's a very big part of Bhutanese culture. But speaking of Bhutanese culture, let's talk about its history because not much is known about its very early history. A lot of it has been lost to time, but it's believed that the first people would have arrived around 2000 BCE. And there is quite a few legends about what might have happened here in Bhutan, but again, none of them can be confirmed. There's actually a huge fire, I want to say, in the 1600s. I didn't write down the year. That destroyed a lot of very ancient texts within Bhutan, so a lot has literally been lost to time. But we do know that in the 7th century, Buddhism was introduced to Bhutan by King Sonsengampo, which you heard about in my Nepal episode. 
He was a big spreader of Buddhism throughout the area here. And by the 8th, 8th, I can't talk, the 8th century, Tantric Buddhism was the predominant religion in Bhutan and still is to this day. It's still very, very important to the culture and people of Bhutan. Not everyone in Bhutan is Buddhist, but the majority. The Mongols invaded during the great Mongol invasions, doing their Mongol thing, as you can imagine. And as the power of the Mongols weakened, various civil wars would break out. Now, there, there were many periods of civil wars before and after the Mongol invasion. Like I said, there's 18 different valleys, and each valley had its own little mini, like, chiefs and things, so they would all fight amongst each other, but... It halted during the Mongol time because the Mongols were there, and it picked back up when the Mongols were long gone. The first person to unify most of what we know as Bhutan today would have occurred in the 16th century. His name was Shabdrang Gawang Namgyal, and he was a very beloved person in the area. He, like I said, unified the country for the first time that we know of in its history. And he built the Zongs. The Zongs are these, you'll see pictures in here, in the book. Oh, you can't see the book. In here, the book. But the Zongs were huge fortresses that were meant to protect the, the valley and region that they were located in. So I believe pretty much all of the major Zongs within Bhutan were built during this time. And what's interesting about Ngawang Yamgyal is that um, after he passed, the government kept his death a secret and told people that he was in a deep meditation and they kept this up for 54 years after his death because, you know, the leaders were very worried about unrest and civil war happening after his death and, believe it or not, after his death was announced, civil wars and things like that would break out again. But this time they had military might behind them and they had their eyes set out on the invading regions here. They had been um, kind of beat a, a little bit by the Tibetans and the Nepalese throughout history and they were ready to start fighting back. So in 1711, they uh, in, went this direction and started to invade Koch Bahar, or Kuch Bahar, sorry which is over here. And they were harassing the Indian people living here. Now, if you know your history, by 1711, the British had quite a bit of presence in India. So, in... Did I write down the year? Do, do, do. I did not. Well, kind of. By the mid to late... Or the mid-1700s, let's say, the Maharaja of Kuch Bihar asked the British East India Company for help to deal with these Bhutanese that were coming in and taking over his territory. So the British attacked Bhutan in 1774 and Bhutan backed down. They signed an agreement to just kind of leave each other alone and let each other do their own thing, which would fall apart about a hundred years later when um, Bhutan would overstep its treaty boundaries, and the British fought back in what's known as the Duar Wars, which lasted from 1864 to 1865, which was when, after Bhutan lost, they lost a lot of their Duar territory down here, which I believe is why we have this area that's gobbled up by India, and yeah, creating this interesting border. So, it seems that Bhutan is kind of out of luck. You know, it is gradually shrinking. It has China up here and British India down here, very extremely powerful neighbors. So it would take a very powerful figure to rise up and, you know, maintain their culture and independence. And in the 1870s, there was a bit of a civil war breaking out. One man um, would come out on top and start unifying the other valleys and dwarves, uh, not dwarves, the Zongs in the area. And that was Ugyen Wangchuk. 
to the point where in 1907, Ugyan Wonchuk was named the King of Bhutan, and his ancestors are still the reigning monarchs of Bhutan today. In 1910, they signed a final treaty with Britain to make sure that Bhutan would maintain its independence um, while, you know, cooperating with the British and just kind of, you know, uh, once again agreeing, I'll leave you alone if you leave me alone. And thus Bhutan was never colonized by the British or the Chinese or anything. They remained their own thing. Now, granted, they were quite an isolationist country during most of its history, including this time they did not want people coming in and interfering with their lives and their culture. Um, but that would slowly start to change by the 1950s. In 1953, a legislative government was established by Jigme Dorji Wanchuk, uh, who was king at the time, and it made it so that it was no longer an absolute monarchy. It was a constitutional monarchy uh, with veto power against the king if time ever came, which it never has. And thus the beginnings of modernization would roll out slowly but surely, but they would also take steps to ensure that traditional values were still upheld in a very interesting set of laws. For example, a national dress was established that every Bhutanese person had to follow to wear traditional clothes at all time. They also made Zongka the official language, which it still is today, among very many other things. And some of these would cause some very serious problems, especially by 1988. Bhutan decided that they would have zero tolerance for anyone who couldn't follow the cultural rules and anyone who could not was declared an illegal immigrant. And the Lhotshampa people who are of Nepalese descent living in Bhutan were expelled. About 100,000 plus people were expelled out of Bhutan. They fled to uh, Tibet up here in China and to Nepal to various refugee camps, some of which still exist today, where people are still living today. It's very controversial. But modernization would again slowly but surely take hold. In 1999, the ban was lifted on television, so people could start buying and watching television. And not long after that, the internet was brought into Bhutan, so people could use the internet. In 2008, the king stepped down and his son became king. He is Jigme Kesar Namgyo Wangchuk, and he's currently the king today. And pretty much that is where we are in the history of Bhutan. Very interesting, you know, a modern nation in terms of environmental awareness and cultural awareness, but still many, many, many ancient traditions still preserved to this day. So in a nutshell, that's the history of Bhutan. I'm going to carefully zoom this out. If I can in my new setup, it might wobble a little bit. There we go. <laughs> Hope you can see my notes. <laughs> yes, I have notes just in case. You think I had all those names memorized? I definitely did not. <laughs> so Bhutan, let's take a look at the book. And I am living in a new city, which is a new library system. They put their barcodes up here in this corner, which blocks the title, which really annoys me. So this is an example of a song. You can see the farming fields nearby, the mountains up here, and they're absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous buildings. I think we'll see a couple more in here. Okay. Some very sweet faces here. This is in the Paro Valley. Oh, my light's a little bright. The house is down here and the mountains looming up above them beautiful farmlands here. We have a great example of the valleys here. The river's running through these huge mountainous valleys. And a little rice farming village here. Some more of the massive Himalayan mountains. And another beautiful valley with the rivers running through. 
the national flower, the blue poppy. And a very cold, snowy day there. the amazing forests here. And this is talking about the issues with commercial logging. It is a law that if anyone has to chop down a tree, they have to plant another. It is the law. The black-necked cranes are very important to the Bhutanese. It is actually very illegal to kill them. You will get years of jail time if you do. And they're just a very beloved and endangered animal. This is the capital city of Timpu, way up high in the mountains, one of the least populated capitals in the world. Some beautiful prayer flags here, not quite fluttering in the wind like we like to see in a lot of the pictures of prayer flags up in the Himalayas, but still very lovely. Wow, this is impressive, isn't it? It looks like a mandala. Uh, but it tells a story. It's really cool. Let's see some yaks up here with nomadic herders way up high in the Himalayas. And here is a beautiful Buddha. And this is the Takzan Monastery. It is the most famous of like all of the buildings within Bhutan. It's definitely the most photographed and the most visited by tourists. Well, you know, another thing is that you have to pay, what is it, $250 a day to be a tourist in Bhutan, and that goes to environmental protection. I think this is, um, yeah, Nyawang Yamgo. Really interesting. And here you can see a British person meeting with um, somebody, with the mogul of Hindustan. And this is the current king, King Jingmei Kesar Namgyal Wangjuk. He's very handsome. I guess, um, yeah, it says up here, in parts of the world he's known as Prince Charming. There's a big old song there. This is in Tashicho Valley. The big military parade. And let's see a community meeting here in the village. the king once again. I, I think there's a picture of his wife in here. His wife is absolutely gorgeous. She is beautiful. It's election day. Oh, it's harvesting. It looks like wheat or something out here in the valley. And a little grocery store out here. You can see what's for sale. What a beautiful post office. Can you see? There we go. That is gorgeous. And this guy's harvesting buckwheat, it says. Another beautiful little farming village here with the big river flowing through. And electricity is a thing now in Bhutan in the past, what, 30 years or so. And some loggers here taking some trees to turn them into beets. see, apples, it says. Yum, yum. And beehives, very important for the environment. This is a very beautiful hotel, isn't it? I love that. And uh, one of the very few highways in Bhutan. I want to say there's only two. I know there's one going into China and one going into India. <laughs> and this is the international airport there built in the traditional style. Another gorgeous picture of the farming village here. And one of the many sayings here for people visiting the area, please leave the valley as you found it. Take litter home with you. There'll be another picture later of the more common saying. Little gas station here, again, built very traditionally. It's really neat. She's taken some firewood home. And let's see, he's making paper with the wood. It's interesting. The paper factory. A beautiful
beautiful sweet snow leopard with its little paws there and look at this this is the national animal this is a takin whoops there you go it is like a, a goat cow ox <laughs> they're so goofy they're so cute here you go jigme dorji national park leave nothing but footprints take nothing but memories they take their environment very seriously here's some more very sweet faces <laughs> so cute and family all together this is showing the difference between national dress i think there'll be more pictures oh yeah definitely so here they are wearing their kiras it's called oh, the, the male's outfit's on the tip of my tongue it's one syllable it'll come to me in a minute i'm sure but they are. I love this picture. Get ready for this. They've got big mustaches. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> and family living nomadic lifestyle up in the mountains. And very sadly, some um, Bhutanese refugees in Nepal. And another ethnic group, the Borkpa. It's another nomadic group. They also have very sweet smile. And scarves are very important. The color of the scarf you wear signifies your rank. Ooh, look at this amazing shop here. Selling some cool jewelry and trinkets. And they're wearing their school uniforms. Here's another. Oh no, these are traditional homes. You can really see after looking at all the pictures of buildings, their type of architecture is very distinct. You're carrying her little sweet baby while well, she's out working in the fields. And another little house with little paintings on it. And this is a funeral. Very colorful. And we're working hard in school. And let's see, she's at a clinic here getting a steam treatment, it says. <laughs> There's some happy monks in training. Some more very sweet smiles here. And this is a Buddhist school. Is that not gorgeous? There's some prayer wheels that you spin so that your prayers go out into the world. Look at this, a death dancer. That is a very scary costume, I think. <laughs> that would certainly frighten me off, which I think is the point of it. A family altar here, like um, quite a few Asian cultures do. Altars like that for their loved ones. And a little bell here, used for rituals. And there's a teacher here giving a lesson. <laughs> Having a nice day out together. And working hard in school again. Working hard in a religious school. And chilling out, having fun. And a store for clothing just to show you the difference in the alphabet here and romanized and in English. Apparently most people in Bhutan speak English because it's easier to connect with India since there's so many languages spoken in India it's easier just to speak English and also for tourists. More sweet faces here I love it <laughs> and being very formal each other. Ooh, it's a festival here. We are playing our horns here. Pretty neat. Here's another beautiful mandala. The crafts for sale. Absolutely gorgeous. And a really cool dancer. The cool mask and costume. Playing a drum yan lute. It's really beautiful and colorful very beautiful painting here. Very colorful. I love all the colors. 
carving these wood pillars very carefully. And here is a chorten, which is pretty much a stupa, where there is something enshrined inside of here that is very, very important, usually some kind of Buddhist relic. Another beautiful monastery. This is a window. <laughs> Isn't it gorgeous? And traditional weavers at work making beautiful, beautiful fabrics and textiles. A go, that's what it's called. <laughs> I got it. The men's clothes are called a go. The women's are called a gira. Playing some soccer out here. <laughs> awesome. And at the movie theater. traditional archers. That's so neat. And they're playing a game which is very similar to bingo as you can see. Uh-oh. The abominable snowman. <laughs> a big beautiful festival dance here. And even more with colorful masks and things. They're all so beautiful and so colorful. Celebrating really neat traditions. Their masks on. And food. Apparently Bhutanese food is very spicy. And you can see they're drying chilies out here on the roofs. Supermarket here. And some traditional foods. Yum yum, you can see some asparagus there. Asparagus <laughs> and chor pea, little cubes of cheesy yak milk. I mean, it doesn't sound too bad. Cheese is cheese at the end of the day. <laughs> and some rice wine being served there. And my goodness, what's happening here? <laughs> I did something up on that pool, I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, some spicy soup and some red bean soup and we have our big map here of Bhutan you can see just how mountainous it is and all of the big valleys can you hear the train outside of the train station <laughs> and that's where Bhutan is located in the world can you see bring that close there's Bhutan <laughs> so that's going to be it for tonight thank you so much for watching I hope that you found this video relaxing and educational and I hope that you have a very good, 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 good